The movie begins with an unnamed woman driving through an empty road amidst the pitch black night. She's listening to a disturbing audiobook, but upon realizing that she's completely alone in the dark, she quickly turns it off. Suddenly, her car crashes into something. After the initial surprise, she gets out of the car to see the damage. Using her phone's flashlight, she also discovers that the road had been tampered with. The crash has been intentional. Upon realizing that she has been baited, a normal person would have immediately hopped into the car and stayed put, trying to search for help. But no, definitely not this lady. She hears a rustling sound from the surrounding woods and uses the flashlight to check. And lo and behold, there's a huge antelope staring directly at her. Frozen with fear, she knows that she's screwed, but worse news awaits her. Right behind her, there's a masked killer, surveying every single move. The antelope seems chill and decides to escape after noticing the masked killer. This lady, on the other hand, heaves a sigh of relief. But this relief is short-lived when she hears rustles from behind her. Just get inside the car, woman. She tries to check the other side and finally, her fear grips her, making her jump into her car. While she's heaving from the sudden adrenaline rush, she hears screeching noises. It's the killer at the back of her car. She tries to start the engine but to no avail. Unfortunately, the masked killer crashes the window and attacks her brutally. In the morning, a group of teenagers arrive at the Whistler camp, run by Owen Whistler. It is a conversion camp for kids in the LGBTQ community. According to Owen, the camp is an inclusive and safe place where they don't force anyone to convert. He also seems extremely charming while explaining how God loves each one of them, but still, he's ready to help those who aren't happy in the way they are. He proceeds to introduce his colleagues, Dr. Cora, the therapist and his wife, Molly, their new doctor, Zane, the athletics director, and Sarah, the activities director and Zane's fiance. There's also a creepy handyman named Balthazar. Everyone's extremely smiley and that's never a good sign. Owen instructs them to submit their phones and laptops. He directs them to their separate boys' and girls' cabins. Now this poses a problem for Jordan who identifies as trans and non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. Owen acknowledges their issues but states that the camp has no gender-neutral cabins so they have to board with the boys' cabin. Later, all the teens are seated for group therapy. Owen goes around the circle and asks them about their reason for coming to the camp. Toby states that he had struck a deal with his parents that if he attended the camp then he'll be able to go to Moulin Rouge. Veronica just displays contempt for being bisexual and wishes it goes away. The others share either their disgust for being gay or their reluctance to be a part of the camp. In the end, Jordan is pressured into sharing their story. They reveal that as they are from a religious family, their parents don't understand their choices. If they attend the camp, they'll be able to legally emancipate and be themselves. Owen looks visibly offended by the mention of emancipation but doesn't mention anything. He just resorts to a cryptic stare. Later that night, in the boys' cabin, the jock Stu seems disgusted by the guys doing skincare. Yeah, skincare apparently reveals your sexuality now, I suppose. Things at the conversion camp are not what it seems when Alexandra is spied on while she's taking a shower. Owen outs her, announcing that she's trans and dumps her in the boy's cabin. Dejected, Alexandra states that she has no boy clothes as she's a woman. Jordan devises a plan. They show up wearing Alexandra's dress instead to piss Owen off, who has started referring to Alexandra as Alexander. He also refuses to call her by the right pronoun. Next, the boys and girls are separated to do activities that are stereotypical masculine and feminine. The boys are made to climb bars, play tug of war and jump on tires. On the other hand, the girls make bracelets. Sarah gives Veronica and Kim a weird look when they exchange their bracelets. Along with the activities, they also undergo individual therapy sessions with Dr. Cora. Alexandra, amidst these activities, slips into the nurse's office to get back her medicines but is caught by Molly. She begs her to return her medicines to her but Molly states firmly that it's against the protocol. With no other option, Alexandra reveals that it's estradiol, her estrogen medication that she needs to take. She tearfully tells Molly the real reason for attending the camp. If she didn't come here, she will never see her younger brother ever again. Moved by her story, Molly gives in. There's no respite from their activities even at night. The teens are awakened in the middle of the night and taken to the forest. There, they are handcuffed with a partner and left alone till the morning. 
It's supposed to teach them some lessons about love and trust, or maybe they could just die in the dark, who knows. Left alone, Veronica and Kim seem to understand each other a little more. Kim reveals to her that she really doesn't understand the community much as she's from a super straight suburb. On the other side, Jordan confides in Alexandra that this place seems extremely sketchy. Alexandra says that it's a gay conversion camp, so of course, nothing about it will feel right. To which they reply that this camp is unlike most. There's no Bible thumping or queer bashing. It's the eerie feeling of it all. Just then, they notice the same masked killer from earlier. Jordan calls out, but the killer just disappears into the darkness. Jordan's guesses are right about the place, of course. While they are in the woods, Dr. Cora and Sarah are going through the private belongings of the teens. Cora discovers Jordan's Bible and finds a picture of their family. She gives a devilish smile. The next day, Jordan waits for their turn outside Dr. Cora's office. They see Gabriel leaving the room in tears. Soon, they understand why Gabriel had broken down so badly. The therapist manipulates them into thinking that their gender identity is connected with their childhood and their relationship with their parents. By the end of the session, Jordan seems confused and their own ideals are shaken. Later that night, Jordan confides in Alexandra about their decision to transition. She advises them to not let these people get to them. To cheer them up, she starts singing Perfect by Pink. Soon, all the others join them in a wholesome dance party. Their bond becomes stronger through this display of support. Whilst the teens are embracing their identity, Owen looks at them in anger and disgust. After everyone has gone to bed, Jordan sneaks into Owen's office to uncover more about the place. They discover photographs that document the history of the place and the insane amount of torture they make the children undergo. Sadly, they are caught by Molly, but she is shocked at the photographs that Jordan shows her. She says that she had no idea and promises to protect the kids. The night is long, it seems, as we follow the handyman Balthazar spying on the girls in the shower through a hidden camera. Suddenly, he is attacked by the masked killer who bludgeons him to death. Good riddance. The next day, the group is divided by gender once again. The boys practice their shooting while the girls learn to bake an apple pie for the boys. At the shooting range, Owen announces that men are bigger than women as they have killer instincts. In other words, it's a biological imperative for men to be violent. Jordan is surprisingly good at shooting, and they defeat Zane in an impromptu competition. This makes Owen praise them, but he has also reverted back to using he for them. Owen's training doesn't stop there. He forces Toby to shoot the dog called Duke who's suffering from cancer. Toby refuses to shoot the poor dog. This angers him and he announces that if he doesn't shoot it, Zane will torture it into death. Seeing Toby break down into a mess, Jordan shoots the dog instead. They throw the gun and leave while the others comfort Toby. We are taken to the girls who are busy making a pie. Sarah seems too obsessed with Kim. It's almost uncomfortable to see her interest. After class, she asks Kim to stay back while the others leave. Sarah tries to touch her inappropriately, prompting the poor kid to escape. Veronica finds her alone by the river. Upon hearing about her experience, she tries to uplift her mood and comforts her. She confesses that she isn't really here to cure herself but to write an essay on the atrocities of gay conversion camps for her college paper. Veronica and Kim share a sweet moment after confiding in each other and they kiss and do stuff that shouldn't be done out in the open, like get a room. Concurrently, Molly is seen going into a shed which has a hell lot of torture weapons. There's also a door that's locked. Before she could force it open, Dr. Cora catches her and asks her to leave. As these events are unfolding, Stu takes a swim in the river. Gabriel offers to join him. He's a man with a purpose. When he finally joins him, Stu gives in to the temptation and kisses him. They take their sexy times into the shed we've seen earlier. After they've done the deed, Stu falls asleep. When he wakes up, he realizes that Gabriel is acting very indifferently. Gabriel abruptly states that nowadays there are too many labels, but what matters are only two, predator and prey. Suddenly, the lights turn on. There's Owen and Zane in the shed with him. Owen criticizes him. They drag the poor boy into a room and strap him forcibly into a chair. Owen talks some crap about aversion therapy, and what proceeds after this is extremely sick and twisted. Stu is electrocuted repeatedly while he sees the pictures of men and women on the screen. Whenever it's a man, he's electrocuted. His condition worsens, and he's taken to Molly. 
Molly firmly refuses to let the torture continue, but Owen subdues her. He asks her to treat him and fires her. Afterwards, we see Zane and Sarah getting down and dirty, but it's absolutely hilarious. They try to get each other off in a way that proves that they are still homosexuals and their relationship is a facade. So, conversion therapy didn't really work on them, huh? Suddenly, they are attacked brutally by the mysterious killer. Then, Gabriel, who's taking a swim, is also attacked. He's electrocuted until he passes away. The others come together upon realizing that there's a murderer. Molly finally steps up and orders Alexandra to take the other kids with her. She instructs her to call the police after she reaches the range. Veronica, Kim, Jordan, and Toby stay behind. Jordan goes to Owen's office to search for clues and discovers the bodies of the victims. Upon hearing Owen's voice, he hides in the closet and sees Cora's dead body. Basically, don't be homophobic or you'll die. When Owen enters the room, he's also attacked by the masked killer. It is revealed that the killer had been Molly all along. She had killed the real Molly to take her place at the camp. Thus, we finally get to know the name of the woman at the beginning of the movie. The current Molly's real name is Angie Phelps. She had attended the camp a long time back and was tortured by Owen. She has come for revenge and will do anything to get it. She's attacked by Owen, but Jordan is quick to threaten him with a gun. Although Angie forces them to shoot him, they're unable to do so. Angie finishes the job by slitting Owen's throat. After the intense fight, she offers Jordan to join her to end the brutality of the conversion camp. Jordan refuses to be a murderer. Just then, the police arrive. Angie is arrested while Stu is taken for treatment. There's a budding romance between him and Toby. It seems like every one of them has finally accepted themselves and is ready to face the world after the traumatic events of the week. 